Hi, folks. Uh, someone's at the door. Uh, my name is John Mooney. Uh, I'm a director of engineering here at Betterment. Uh, and I want to talk to you a little bit about how we use Airflow with DBT and Tableau as well. Um, uh, well. We'll obviously get more into it, but one of the main reasons we're, we're using DBT uh, is actually to add a little bit of source control and a little bit of um, uh, uh, engineering rigor around what we, uh, we actually, the data we use in Tableau. Um, and then we use Airflow for task management, and obviously you know what DBT is, uh, but we'll get a little bit more into it. Uh, so first I want to tell you a little bit about myself and why I'm here. Um, that's not me, that's John Stein, our CEO, and this is the Betterment presentation template that I used. Um, I've worked at uh, Betterment for about six years now uh, and started when we were uh, a much smaller company as Betterment's first and only data analyst. Um, so came from IBM, uh, I was doing that for a while and sort of has transitioned my career pretty quickly into data engineering uh, and now more broad uh, uh, customer facing engineering with some Rails squads and Java, some Python and things like that, uh, the things we do at Betterment now. Um, in my current role, uh, I, I'm in charge of analytics as well as data engineering and a couple other functions. So obviously I care very much about data uh, and how we use it at Betterment. A uh, little bit about Betterment real quick. I think I have notes on this. We're the largest online investment advisor. If you add enough superlatives to any statement, you can be the best at something. Um, we manage about $17 billion right now, uh, and we make it easy for people to invest and save for their goals uh, for a very low cost. Uh, I would be remiss if I did not mention that Betterment is hiring data engineers right now. If you Google data engineer, um, Google seems to think that they wear hard hats. Uh, so I took every hard hat picture I could find on the uh, Google Images page. Um, we're hiring a couple different levels of data engineers. Um, our data engineers are using Python. Uh, our applications are mostly built on Postgres, uh, a legacy one on MySQL. Uh, our data warehouse is in Redshift. We are getting rid of Luigi, but we were on Luigi for a while uh, in favor of Airflow. Um, we help our analysts execute R, and we do some modeling execution in R. Uh, we have a, uh, a pre-caching Rails service that we use in order to make our customer experience faster and more efficient. And of course, we use DBT and Tableau as well. Um, and then finally, our, our, our our uh, continuous integration is on Circle and our, our continuous deployment is on Jenkins. So let's talk a little bit about Airflow, DBT, and Tableau. Um, so let's start with Airflow. Uh, if you don't know what Airflow is, it's an open source project uh, that started at Airbnb and is now incubated by Apache. Um, it's written mostly in Python and it does three main things. It does task scheduling, uh, distributed execution, and dependency management. So on the task scheduling side, Think of it like cron. In fact, you can actually, you can actually pass in cron-like statements to decide when you run various jobs. Um, on the distributed execution side, you can run an arbitrary number of workers uh, that are picking up batch tasks to execute um, and can, can obviously operate in parallel, uh, which is one of the most useful parts about DBT, excuse me, about Airflow. Uh, and then finally, it does dependency management, which we're going to talk a lot about today. Um, it's got a, a built-in mechanism that you may have heard of called DAGs, or Directed Acyclic Graphs. Um, and basically, we'll, again, we'll talk more about it, but it allows uh, various tasks to sort of wait on downstream dependencies and make sure they don't run too soon or run against incomplete data or something like that. Uh, you may know that DBT has a mechanism like this built into it itself, uh, so it can run upstream uh, uh, models in parallel, uh, and then the models that depend on those will wait to run until the other model has been created. In fact, they just overhauled that recently. Um, this is what Airflow looks like. So this is a real, uh, a real DAG uh, or a real process that we have uh, at Betterment. This is all the things that need to happen in order for us to calculate what we need to charge people in fees every day. Um, if we dig into one of these, uh, this is just the top portion. Um, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different nodes here. But if we break it down a little bit, um, we can actually see that these root nodes that have no upstream dependencies all execute in parallel um, whenever they're ready to run. Um, we've got a second thing that can execute when 1A is complete, and then once 1B and 2 are complete, we can execute the third thing, and then it's a, it's a, a linear chain on up uh, the process to finish the DAG. Uh, again, DBT has this built into itself when it, when it executes models in parallel. Uh, let's talk about DBT for a second. Um, I learned this morning that I'm not good at explaining what DBT is. Uh, when my, I run, reminded my wife that I was going to be speaking at this meetup tonight and that I'd be home late, and she said, what's DBT? Um, and I said, uh, <laughs> um, I, I think I said something like, well, it's, it's, like, um, 
it's like object oriented SQL with uh, directed acyclic graphs and s schema column level invariant testing. And I think I lost her at invariant testing. Um, but the way we use dbt at Betterment, uh, we use just three of the basic functions. We use dbt run, we use dbt test, and dbt generate docs. Um, we actually have a doc site running internally for one of our particular data marts. Um, we try to be really good about documentation, really good about tests. Um, this is a view that um, gives us trade information about uh, some subset of our customers and makes it a lot easier to interact with our data for our analysts uh, and even some of our relationship managers who are getting questions about uh, what trades look like for their customers and things like that. Let's talk about Tableau. Um, Tableau is something you're probably familiar with. It's one of the like relatively original interactive BI products. It's been around since like 2003 or 2004 or something like that. Um, we use Tableau for uh, a few things. Uh, source of truth dashboarding, meaning company-wide dashboarding of like this is the fact and this is the thing that you should follow uh, for some of our key business metrics. Uh, we use it for self-service. Uh, every one of our employees is able to log in to our, our online Tableau server. Uh, and play around with data. Um, most of them don't, uh, but everyone technically can do that. Um, last thing we use it for is email reports. Uh, so you can email these dashboards on particular schedules with subscriptions uh, and so forth. So when we adopted Tableau, that was actually what really kicked off our need for DBT in the first place. Um, we wanted to A, avoid too much vendor lock-in, meaning we didn't want to have too much going on in DBT. We wanted to keep our options open for the future because these BI products are very expensive. We want to stay flexible there. Um, but I also, or we also wanted to be able to expose and validate the accuracy of the data sets that Tableau is using. So the mechanisms that Tableau have built in for that, um, of course you can write custom SQL in Tableau. Um, but I, I personally didn't like this because then it lives in the tool. It's very hard to review. Uh, and if you want to get off Tableau, you've lost all that work. It all just sort of lives in there. Um, so one of the reasons we adopted Tableau is so we could have a real engineering focused workflow for this stuff. Um, so this is a real PR of us adding a DBT view or a DBT model um, uh, and, and actually requesting that I have review on this thing, that it's correct. I link out to my Asana task. Um, I talk about the testing I did and that sort of thing. So that's been really nice for us. Our analytics team is, is full of uh, very, very smart, ambitious, uh, and active uh, writers of DBT models. Um, but it's nice that our data engineers who might know a little bit more about the underlying data are able to get in there and actually validate that we're using the data in the correct way and that we can call this thing correct going forward. Uh, so that's been a really great use of DBT. So let's talk about how we put Airflow, DBT, and Tableau together. Uh, this is a, a fairly real example uh, of a report that we send out on a weekly basis, where we've got a Tableau dashboard or a report. It is sitting on top of, of a series of data extracts, and we have a one-to-one -one link of data extracts to Tableau models. Uh, so the interesting part comes when looking at these Tableau models um, while this is a pretty slide, there's like a ridiculous amount of stuff behind these Tableau models of upstream dependencies that we need to make sure are ready to go uh, before we go extract this data into Tableau and send out this email and say it's correct. So how do we manage that? Um, we're back at this, uh, this view of a DAG. I want to get something like this created um, again so we can make sure that upstream dependencies are complete before we refresh the DBD models and then uh, refresh the corresponding Tableau extract. So the first question is, how do we get Tableau to run, excuse me, yes, how do we get DBT to run in Airflow? So like any good engineer, oh man, the mouse was up here the whole time. That would have killed me. <laughs> um, so like any good engineer, the first thing I did was go to the docs uh, and I looked for the word Airflow and I saw running DBT in production using Airflow. I was like, sweet, someone's already figured this out. Um, so when we go to the docs, it says if your organization is already using Airflow, that could be a great way to kick off your DBT runs. <laughs> I, I, I very much appreciate that it's documented, but unfortunately this wasn't quite the answer. So the next thing I said was, okay, cool. Uh, let's check out the API and see how I can interact with it in Python. So I went over here and I searched for API. And the second thing there is the DBT API. It's possible to import and invoke DBT as a Python module. Cool, I can just invoke it directly. So let's look at the doc here. While it's typically invoked in command line, it's possible to import. This API is presently undocumented and is liable to change in the future. <laughs> so the question remains, uh, how do we get Python to work with, with uh, um, DBT, which is ironically written in Python? Uh, so the answer um, is, let's do a little bit of declarative programming. Um, let's work, I'm going to work backwards from the public interface 
of, of what we actually made um, to, to show you kind of how we went about doing this thing. So I'm going to throw some Python at you. I hope it's not too much. Uh, these are the public methods. We have run, test, and generate docs on the bottom. We've got a class called dbt. Uh, if you're a, a, a Pythonista, you can see we're in, inheriting from object, uh, which basically means we're still on Python 2.7, which is end of life on January 1st. We're working on it. Um, so, so this class gets instantiated with a profile, a target, a number of threads, and a directory to which to point. Uh, if you use dbt, these should be some familiar things to you. Um, modeled out methods for the, the three functions we use, which again are run, test, and generate docs, with a couple of options. Um, so you can see, it, we're, you know, let's look at run, for example. We're executing a private method called dbt execute. It's passing in an action called run, uh, and then it's passing in some sort of built options. So let's go to the next step. This is how we would invoke this. And it looks pretty similar to how you would invoke it uh, in, in actual dbt command line interface. Um, on the top one, we don't pass anything to run, meaning it's going to do what dbt run would do, which is execute all models. Uh, the second example, it's going to execute a certain list of models. Uh, and the third example, it's going to run all the models except the ones listed right there. The dirty secret of this particular thing is I'm kind of cheating because all, all I'm really doing is building a string and then executing it in a subprocess. Um, so if you look at what's going on here, we have an action that gets interpolated. We have profiles directly, which can, gets interpolated and so forth on down the line. Uh, and the, the real execution of this is just, you know, that command line there, the second line on the page. Uh, we're just doing string interpolation on that, on that base command and then executing it in a subprocess. This is not like a recommended way to program in general, um, but it is nice that I get to leverage the things that dbt does really well, like threading, um, dependency management, and things like that, uh, and that I don't have to worry, I, I don't think I have to worry too much about contracts changing in the future. I feel pretty good about the fact that three years from now, there's going to be a command called dbt run, or dbt test, or dbt generate docs. Let me know if that's not the case, Drew, uh, and we'll, we'll try to divert resources or something. Um, Cool, so now we know how to execute dbt uh, from Python. How do we execute dbt in Airflow? Well, let's see. Um, this is what a DAG looks like. So I showed you a lovely picture of all these dependency management things. That gets compiled from code that looks like this. So this is an example invocation of a dbt DAG. Um, uh, we've got a, a few things to find about when we should start running, the interval at which we should run. I mentioned that uh, uh, schedule interval in, in Airflow takes cron arguments, um, so that's saying execute it at midnight. I'm getting some parameters from my, my secure database, uh, and then I'm executing what's called an Airflow Python operator. An Airflow Python operator allows you to execute arbitrary Python code uh, from Airflow itself. So I've got this Python callable called dbt run. I pass in some keyword arguments of a profile, a target, and a list of models, and that's it. Uh, that's now part of my DAG. It's going to get executed at midnight every night. Next step, let's talk about how Python interplays with Tableau. This one was a little more straightforward. Tableau has been around for a very long time, uh, and it's been a, an engineering-focused BI solution for a long time. Um, so they have a pretty good uh, uh, Python package. Um, I won't get too much into this, but the bottom method there, refresh, refresh data source, takes in the name of a Tableau extract, uh, and it just triggers a refresh of that extract, and it waits until it's done. The waiting is actually very important here. I, I, I could have executed that asynchronously, but I part of this whole process is that I want to make sure that I wait until it's done uh, before I run the next step in my DAG. Uh, OK, so now running uh, Python extract, excuse me, uh, Tableau extract refreshes in Airflow. Uh, this looks pretty similar to the last one. Um, I'm using that same Python operator, which allows me to execute arbitrary Python from, uh, from Airflow. Uh, and I'm calling, I have that Python callable that is tableau.refreshdatasource, passing in some keyword arguments of a host, a username, a password, and a data source name. All I'm saying is please refresh this data source. Uh, and that's pretty much it. So let's put it all together. Um, we've got Airflow, we've got DBT, and we've got uh, Tableau all together now, which is a Beatles song. It's also a line in All You Need Is Love. You know, all together now. Is that familiar at all? Um, this is what the three things look like together, and, and I'll, uh, it, it, we've already seen the top two portions. This is defining uh, um, the different nodes in the, in the, in the DAG, um, but the bottom is the most important part. I'm saying in order to call this DAG complete, wait for combined silly DAG extract to complete, and then uh, in order for <laughs> that one to complete, wait on combined silly DAG dbt run to complete. And the, the like, rather disappointing ta-da moment is this. <laughs> 
this is what that code generates. Uh, this is saying, make sure that that refresh attribution model extract does not run until the dashboard DBT run completes. Uh, to take it one step further, this is a, a real DAG that we have to refresh um, a, a marketing dashboard we have that does partial attribution and links up with some LTV data. Um, I've got these dependency sensors for DAG, which is a thing that we built internally uh, that basically says wait on these other DAGs to finish uh, with some, some various considerations around that. Um, and the inheritance that I'm really laying out here looks like this. So uh, I've got a thing that says do not extract that Tableau run until these two DBT models run and do not run these two DBT models until these other unrelated, DAG, well, highly related rather, DAGs run. Um, it does some nice UI things because the two DBT runs depend on the same uh, set, of, uh, set of requirements or upstream dependencies. It like collapses them just so the interface is not too fat. Um, but that's pretty much it. That's how the three things link together. Uh, and that's how we make sure that data is, is ready to go by the time we extract it in Tableau. Um, if you're interested in working at Betterment, uh, please talk to me again. We're hiring a couple data engineering roles. Um, we'd love to talk to you about it. Um, can I answer any questions? Yeah. Ooh, question. Yeah. So the question is, uh, why why did I use the Python operator instead of using uh, another Airflow um, uh, piece of functionality called the Bash operator, whose job is to literally execute lines of Bash? Uh, the main thing was I was trying to provide a good interface and uh, some object orientedness around the actual D, uh, uh, DBT. Uh, library that I was interacting with. Um, and it's also more, I, I can use it in other contexts as well. So maybe two, so five years ago, everyone was like, Luigi is awesome. <laughs> and now everyone's like, Luigi's terrible, use Airflow. And in five years, someone's probably going to be like, Airflow's terrible, use this next thing. Um, so by keeping the code in tight libraries in, in, uh, in just, just bare Python libraries and using Python operator, I can sort of future proof my code to some extent. Um, there's also some benefits to, we're not on it yet, but there's some uh, nice things you can do in Kubernetes uh, for uh, containerized execution of these things um, that we're going to be taking advantage of this year as well. True. I would love to. <laughs> Um, so Betterment, uh, as, as I, I may or may not have explained very well, uh, is an online investing service. Um, and, and part of being an, uh, an investing service is it's, it's highly regulated. So the SEC comes knocking for audits, FINRA comes knocking for audits, the Department of Labor comes knocking for audits. Uh, and we have to have pretty rigorous algorithms governance around the code that we merge in. Um, so in the analytics use case, it's a little bit less intense than, say, the trading use case where a wrong bug could cost people $17 billion, uh, like a bad line of code. Um, so we review those things very carefully to make sure we don't introduce regressions that are going to hurt our customers' wallets. On the analytics side, there is similar risk, but in different ways. If I put in a bad uh, DBT model that leads us to make a bad business decision that could lead us to do bad things for our customers, we don't want that story. Um, so we have a system that we, we built internally called Nanda, uh, and it's an approvals and auditing system. Uh, so on any given pull request you put out, uh, you need to have what's called a domain reviewer and a platform reviewer. The domain reviewer is a person that understands what you're doing from a business perspective uh, and can validate that your code is doing what you think it's doing. A platform reviewer is more of an expert in the language or the platform that you're using. So a platform reviewer for this pull request would probably be a data engineer that knows our best practices around SQL and can say like, well, yeah, but please format it this way, or like you don't need to do this join, or this table isn't what you think it is, and that sort of thing. Um, we use it on all of our repos internally. Um, again, for the most part, it's for algorithms governance, but on this side, it's, it's just a nice way to make sure that you have good review of your code before it goes out. Any other questions? All right, folks, thank you very much. Oh, wait. So the question is, have we had any success paralyzing DBT runs? Generally speaking, um, we try to let DBT do its thing as far as parallelization goes. 
Um, we actually, we, you, we definitely could run into situations where we try to execute things concurrently because we didn't think about it and we have deadlocks in the database and things like that. We haven't run into that, but that's definitely a risk of this framework that because I'm, I'm, I'm executing smaller slices of models, um, we could run into situations where those things start conflicting at the same time, but we haven't encountered that yet. That's a great point though, I gotta think about that. All right, thanks folks.